Rub up your engines! Okay, you want to know about cold weather and electric cars? Here's a good story. This woman joined Mueller, they got an electric car, and they found out they had cold weather nearly wrecked their 2,500 mile adventure. They went from Michigan to Florida and back. The whole thing was about 2,500 miles. They planned it excessively. Where they're going to stop, where they're going to go, where there's Electrify America, where they can charge them up quick because they were using an electric Kia and it has an 800 volt charging system. So they can use the Electric by America and EV goes fast chargers. They had to take extra details and drive a lot further to get to them. It's very inconvenient. But what they found was as we approached our home in Detroit, the temperature dropped snow and sleet. And then they worried, we're going to make it home. And then they said the trip took a lot longer and they blamed Ohio. They went through Ohio going from Michigan to Florida, right? The state bills itself as a growing hub for battery and electric vehicle manufacturing. But I-75 from Cincinnati and Toledo is pretty much a charging desert when it comes to DC fast charging, which you went on a road trip. There weren't any. Now, they're coming back through Ohio from Florida. I said, we left Kentucky and crossed the Ohio River into Cincinnati. We could have been home by midnight if we were driving a gas car even if we stopped for dinner. But we hadn't had time for charging. But our charging options were terrible. So we rented a hotel room. Then in the morning it didn't look bad. So we had to head east to get an electrify station in a Walmart parking lot east of Dayton. They charged at 96%, which is supposed to be 249 miles away. Home was 215. So they thought they'd make it home. When they're driving to Ohio, the temperatures dropped into the low 40s. They lost range. At 10%, they had 21 miles to go to make home. We got a low battery warning. At 8%, 17 miles off the car said it was blocking outside air for comfort. So the windows started to fog up. But luckily for us, when we got into General Motors headquarters at Detroit Renaissance Central, there were four EV go fast chargers out front. So you have to plan things. And when the plans don't work out, then you got to plan again where to go, where to drive. Now they say, oh, look, we got lucky. We got there so we could make it home because it had four EV chargers. Okay, this is one person driving a car. They get there, there's four chargers. Imagine if there are millions of these electric cars driving around. Oh, great, you get there, there's four chargers and there's 800 people waiting to use them, right? It shows the hassle that it is now. Imagine if there were a whole bunch of people actually driving the things. It would be an absolute cluster mess having to charge them up, taking on long trips. These things aren't made for long trips. The country is not set up for long trips in electric cars. And this is a newer one that can do the big 800 volt charging that's faster to charge it up, right? And if you followed anything I said, and you know anything about electronics, if you supercharge electric batteries like that super fast, their lifespan has deteriorated dramatically. Even regular lithium batteries like this, you charge them super fast, they'll die quicker. You want to charge them slow overnight, right? Well, when you're traveling, you can't do that. So you get a faster charge, but you're also going to degrade your battery and it's going to wear out. And those things cost many thousands of dollars when they go bad. So I mean, the whole setup is kind of topsy-turvy. Car Guy 311 says, why do my ignition cords keep going bad? I got a 2011 Corolla with 280,000 miles. I had one go bad a year ago, the ignition coil, and then I thought I'll change them all with Denso OEM coils. Lo and behold, I did replace cylinder four coil twice since then. What's going on here? You keep having to change that one coil. Right? Odds are the wiring going to that coil or the computer, the driver circuit for that coil is starting to go bad. Now, you never know. Maybe your engine isn't grounded correctly, especially on that end. What I would do if I were you, just as giggles for a test, would be get a 10 gauge wire, put it on the negative terminal, the ground terminal of the battery, and then run that right next to the metal on the number four coil on the engine. If the engine isn't grounded right, the coil fires a lot of electricity, but it's got to go into metal that's grounded. If it's not grounded right, it can end up destroying the coil. So do that and you might find, gee, thanks, Scotty, that fixed my whole thing. Now it took years for it to happen. So it's going to take years for you to figure out that fixed it, but that's the only real logical. Used OEM Toyota coils. There's either probably in the wiring field of coils or the engine is not grounded correctly and it's so easy to put a ground wire do that could easily fix the whole thing because you need power which is the power going through the spark plugs but it has to be grounded if you say you have a spark plug you have it on the coil but instead of having it on the engine you have it up in the air and you crank the engine you won't get any spark because the spark plug has to be grounded on the engine in order for it to fire Hicko Hansen says should I change my own battery or take it to a mechanic I got a 2016 GMC 1500 extended cab I took it to get a battery and the place refused I said we're not trying to install it ah oh, we don't know you got to do all kinds of stuff could I just buy it Walmart and change it myself? Sure, why not? Now, it's not like you have a BMW, okay? You have a BMW, change the battery, all kinds of stuff's got to be reprogrammed, including the battery, because the computer on 
the BMW counts how old the battery is in terms of days and years. And if you just replace the battery with a new battery and you don't reset the computer, it thinks it's an old battery. It will overcharge the battery and probably ruin it in about a year. Take a picture of where everything is so you know you make sure you put all the parts back on and do it yourself. It's something you can easily do. I don't know, those guys sound like they're out of their minds to me. Chico Young says, I got a hissing sound coming from my fuel tank. I got 2008 Mazda 3. When a gas gets below half a tank, there's a hissing sound. Is it a fuel pump that's failing? I, I don't know. Generally, a hissing sound shh, means you got a leak somewhere. Try another gas cap. It could be the gas cap's not sealing. If not that, it's usually the EVAP system that gets the gas vapors and then either burns them in the engine or cleans them through the EVAP canister charcoal, EVAP charcoal canister, and then puts pure air out so it doesn't pollute. Because fuel pumps, when they go bad, they don't really hiss. They hum. Mm -hmm. There's bearings in them. As they wear out, mm -hmm. the bearings make noise as they're humming along as they're spinning really fast. They don't really hiss. Check for evap leaks. Get another gas cap. That makes a lot more sense because you said when it gets under half a tank. When you get under half a tank, that means half the tank or more is air and the rest is gasoline. So you got a lot more air and vacuum so it can make hissing noises as the evap system screws up or the gas cap has a leak and it'll suck. You'll hear hissing. Damien says, Scotty, I recently bought a 99 Buick Regal LS with only 100,000 miles with 3800 Series 2 engine. It's great shape. What do you think about it? Here's the thing about those Buicks. Those are one of the best engines they ever made, those 3800s. They can run forever. But the transmissions are a little bit weak. Now, do take in consideration that Buicks are known as old man cars. If you bought one from an old man, generally the old men don't drive them all that hard. And if they don't drive them all that hard, guess what? The transmissions aren't damaged. Now, let's say you drive real fast and you bought it from an old man. And now you're going to drive it fast, even though he didn't. You'll wear the transmission out. That's the weakest point. If you just baby it and drive it, it can last a long time. But it does have a weak transmission. So don't go around doing burnouts with it or you'll destroy the transmission. Brian D61 says, what half inch lug nut remover do you recommend? I returned a Craftsman CMCF90. 21B couldn't break 135 torques. If you want to get one that's going to take lug nuts off, you really need a more powerful one. And you're better going with the companies that make quality stuff. Go for like Ingersoll, Rand, whatever, any quality company. Now, the really quality ones are expensive. They can be 350, 400, 500 bucks or more. From my experience, if you go to Harbor Freight Tools, right? And you buy their top of the line electric one. It'll only be a hundred something bucks. And they generally work good enough to take your wheels off. Don't buy the cheap one, but buy the more expensive electric one. And it generally works pretty good. They're always changing brands and stuff, but they're top of the line electric ones. They're only usually a hundred something bucks and they work good enough to take your wheels off. Because if you're going to do the pros, Bosch, things like that, the price is super expensive. Those are more for professional people. Brian Glenn. Morning, Scotty. What do you think of the 2021 Venza? Thank you. Well, that's a great question because I just checked one out. <laughs> the other day, guy brought me a 2021 Venza, and I was totally impressed with it. It was excellent. He got 47 miles a gallon in town in that thing. They're well-made vehicles. The problem with the Venzas were they're at a price point that, for its size and its price, they're kind of in no man's land. They're relatively expensive, and uh, a lot of people think, I'll spend a little bit more and get a Lexus that's a little higher quality, or they want to go a lot cheaper and get, like, uh, a Honda or a Corolla hatchback or a Corolla. But for what they are, they're excellent vehicles. If you say looked at one and you like the way it drove and run, you'll be totally happy with it. They're really well made. There's no arguing that. They're just at a kind of a weird price range for what they have in a very competitive crossover smaller SUV scenario. There's so many of them out there that uh, they're not that great in terms of the sales, but they're great vehicles. Luke T says, is it harmful to have too much oil in your car? Well, of course it is, especially in the engine. You put too much oil in, it'll build up too much oil pressure. It will pop the seals out. And then if the rear main seal of the engine pops out, you got to pull the transmission off in order to replace it. So yeah. And if you really put in like four or five quarts too much, you can actually bend the piston rods. There's so much oil, there's no room for compression and things will crush and it will blow your engine. So yeah, that's why there's dipsticks. Never let it go over the top of the dipstick on a level surface after it's sat for five minutes once you turn it off. Too much, suck it out. Don't drive with too much oil. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.